morning or good afternoon. I'm uh, Thea Bombeck, and I would like to present myself with a poem, not just to illustrate who I am, but also to take the time to land and pause and really dig into the topic. It's a poem by Herman de Koning, The Handy Woman. I meant doors, I meant a chair, I meant windows, and through that window you can see a little day further again. I meant for everyone a within and a without, and that small window is a maybe. I meant what others broke, myself to begin with. I take care of as an old sofa that creaks a bit, that is the suspension of my soul deep inside. And this poem by Herman de Koning is by far the most accurate definition of what coaching and supervision is for me. I don't make chairs, I don't make doors. However, I try to make windows through, we, through which my clients, my supervisees can see their inner beauty a little bit further, that they can see their inner potential and lift it. And uh, like I said, I meant what others broke. Yeah, we will come to that. <laughs> um, what the impact is of uh, our family of origin, because that will be the topic I'm very passionate about uh, on the impact of loyalty and what it means for us. And so, in fact, by going this, uh, this way with my clients, I heal myself too. And I see coaching also as a co-creative process, not I am the one knowing it, but really we, I see it as a, um, yeah, I consider myself as an ally uh, and doing this journey together. So the topic of today is, on uh, loyalty, loyalty at work, uh, in your work, but also how loyalty functions and how you can use this topic as a catalyst for increasing self-awareness in your supervision. Before we do that, uh, I would like to uh, launch a poll just to have an idea to what extent you are already uh, with aware of this topic. Um, and I will launch the poll. So can I do that, Lily? Can I do it myself? It looks like it is launched. Yes, can people yes. see the okay. poll? Yeah. Okay. Can you see the poll? <clears throat> oh, no, I have to share my screen. Wait, wait, wait. No, it, people can see it. Ah, okay. Um, so the question is, to what extent uh, you feel happy or successful in your job? And then you have four possible, oh, I see everybody <laughs> answered already. So do you practice the same or similar profession as one of your parents and are you happy or not happy uh, practicing a different, um, uh, the same and are you unhappy? But apparently most of you practice a different profession than your parents and you are happy in the job. That's already very good news. <laughs> Um, of course, I realized that at the time of our parents, coach is a rather recent profession, so really the same profession is very unlikely, but something typical, uh, similar in healthcare, for instance, could have been too. Fantastic, that's very good news. That will go a bit against what I will tell you, but you will know why. Okay, I will share my slides. By the way, uh, I will share the slides afterwards. Uh, Lily will put them on the website like you used to. Um, so 92% of you practice a different profession and you're happy in your job, which is good news. So I stop sharing and uh, then I will share my screen. One second. So, um, what I will, 
where does it come from? In fact, loyalty, uh, that this topic is deeply explored by Ivan Bozromeni Notch. He was an Hungarian psychiatrist, also a Jew uh, psychiatrist. And um, in fact, he uh, was, he studied schizophrenia and he studied a lot about the impact of the family of origin. And as he was brought up between judges and accountants, this resonates in his theory that he developed. But apart from that, he was influenced by two uh, important figures in his life. The one being Martin Buber, who is an anthropologist and who wrote a book, Ich und Du, I and Thou, and who, who really stressed all true life happens through encounter. So in the relationship between people. And the other important person was uh, Ronald Farbeng, also a psychiatrist, who stressed that children develop the relation in their parents that has an impact on them. Oops, I have an echo. Sorry, can we make sure people mute themselves while uh, the speaker is speaking, please? Thank you. Uh, so that he, he Farbein says that children learn very, at very young age to relate to another person, which in the beginning he considers as an object as the other. And that has a main influence and that will go later. Have, he takes that, that will shape him and he takes that in the rest of his life. And he wrote some books. But at the end of the PowerPoint, I have some sources where you, if you are interested, you can find more. So what is the very briefly, uh, Notch considers that there are four dimensions of the reality. The first dimension is the facts. That is your genetic input, your physical health, gender, ethnic, uh, cultural background, uh, social, socioeconomic status. So um, events that happen in your life, for instance, a father who got bankrupt or uh, divorce that you experience. So that are the facts. The second dimension is the individual psychology. There he means that is everything related to emotions, feelings, um, convictions. And that is very often, how do I live? these facts, how um, people I like, I uh, dislike, so what happens in my life, to, how do I relate with it emotionally? The third dimension is the systemic uh, transaction dimension. That means uh, that uh, that are the communication patterns, the interaction patterns that uh, we live in relationship with other people. And that is also uh, yeah, where we found uh, coalitions. Uh, how do we deal with hierarchy? How do we deal with power? That is all the third dimension. And then the fourth dimension is the dimension of the relational ethics, meaning that, um, remember I told he was son of accountants, uh, that there has to be um, a balance between what somebody gives in a relationship and what you re receive in a relationship. Uh, so there must be a reciprocity, um, there must be trustworthiness in relationship. And there he develops that further. Just very briefly, because I could talk just about the theory, but I want to point out one element, the impact of loyalty. So it is really, uh, the element of fairness of trust in relationship and also the meaning of entitlement is a very important uh, notion, meaning that when you give something in relationship, you are entitled to receive. Maybe not the same thing, it can be in another form and another shape and later, but there must be a balance. So a, a second a very important element is that the relation, what, 
Hargrave called the relational imperative about life. So meaning that we understand ourselves through relationship with others. Our self-image is built on what our parents and our siblings and important people in the beginning of our life, what they mirror us about us. And for the others, it's the other way around. So they understand themselves through their relationship with us. I want, I can tell a lot about that, but that's not the purpose of this webinar. So I will focus on how this loyalty plays a role. Uh, he says, uh, human relations are, uh, the human being is by definition relational. He exists in relation and it gives meaning to his life. And the painting you see here, that's a painting from Rajat Jonquire and the title is, your inaccessibility makes me vulnerable. And it's a fantastic painting. I received it for my 40th birthday. It's in our living room. And so every day I am reminded of how important the relationship between people is. And yeah, why I, it gives meaning to why I do my job. So before we dig into it, the definition of loyalty, it is not about psychologically lo loyal, but it's about being loyal relationally. So there is a mutual interest that, uh, based on fidelity and re reliability, and it is based on acquired merit and fulfilled responsibilities. So my Michielsen, the person, one of my trainers in this uh, contextual thinking, she said that uh, it's in fact finding a balance, a relationship creates obligations and expectations and when we have self-selected relationship with friends, partners, maybe job, um, that are relatively, between brackets, short relationship. But our existential relationship, meaning that the relationships uh, with our parents, siblings, um, these relationships are longer because uh, there are influences from earlier generations. And a lot of um, things, um, thoughts, principles, way of living have been passed down from generation to generation. He says, uh, she says, and, and not says that too, that there is in fact, an, when chi a child receives life from his parents, there is an irreversible bond. Um, between them, and you can cons consider it as positive or negative, but um, you can even try to deny it, but uh, it exists. Uh, you can, you can uh, try to ignore it, I mean, but uh, it is still there. Um, and that is important to be aware of that. So and even previous earlier generations have impact still on things that happen. Uh, for instance, the generation that lived the war, we most of have haven't lived that, but we still experience influences from what our parents lived and our grandparents lived still influence our life. And just a quote to summarize, um, that is, Three roots and three trunks, the painting from Van Gogh, one of his, the last painting he made. But I choose them because it's uh, to illustrate the quote I, I want to make is, all things must come to the soul from its roots, from where it is planted. And that is also the impact of the generations before us, how they influence, how we think, how we live, how uh, yeah, uh, what values we have. So this as an introduction to do, dig into the topic. Uh, loyalty at work. How does loyalty work? First, I need to make distinction between some forms of loyalties. 
And the first one is the most important one that is existential loyalty. Existential comes from Latin, existere means that um, that is the, the loyalty between the biological parents and the child. So when parents give life to the child, um, that the child is in debt because he received this gift of life and he cannot give that back to uh, the parents. So he will find, he or she will look for other ways to bring the bal bring again balance. Even if you are not brought up with your biological parents, this loyalty stands. And that is very um, challenging. That's one of the reasons why it's so complicated when children are adopted. Even if they have never known their biological parents, there are some, they still remain loyal. And that can be expressed in a positive way or also in a less positive way. Just one example to illustrate that. Years ago, uh, we were at a BNB in France, in the south of France. And my husband had chosen the BNB uh, because the, the one of the owners played piano. And uh, I'm an historian of art. So uh, he said, Thea, we like that. So, and the, the woman shared with us that she was a piano teacher and um, she was adopted, but she only found it out at, at the age of 30. And she, she was single child. And she said, from the age of three or four, I played the piano on everything that I could. <laughs> and her parents, which she taught her biological parents, could not understand that because none of the two was uh, had anything and any affinity with uh, with music, and she had to insist very long she could play the piano, and um, she became then she said yeah I'm not good enough so she became a piano teacher, and at the age of thirty she found out by incident by, by coincidence that she was adopted, and that her father <laughs> was. I don't know the nationality, uh, but a piano, a professional uh, piano player. So that means that, yeah, she had the gift, the talent to play piano from her biological father, even if she had never known about that. And this is a very positive, her uh, adoptive parents, by the way, were teachers. So she, co she combined the loyalty towards her biological father by playing uh, piano and she was loyal to her adoptive parents by becoming a teacher. So children are very creative in this. The other uh, loyalty by merit that is that, for instance, in a friendship that you do something for um, or in a professional relationship, uh, you, you work, you deliver a project and you are paid for it. So that is loyalty by merit. Then the second is the distinction between horizontal and vertical uh, loyalty. Horizontal loyalty means where you are at the same layer. So between siblings, between friends, um, between colleagues in a job, where the vertical um, loyalty is where you have a hierarchy. So parents are at another layer than the children or uh, your boss in a work setting is at another layer than the colleagues, the colleagues you work with. What we see is that very often if there is a conflict, and I will come to that, that the vertical relationship will win. What do I mean by that? Just simple example, when you come home uh, with the man of your life and your parents don't like him at all, then there are some possibilities. Or they see that you are happy with him and after a while they accept him. 
or they still don't accept things. And then you have a very big challenge. And very often you will break the relationship out of loyalty towards your parents, because it's very difficult to build a life with somebody that is not accepted by your parents. Or the other way can be if you still uh, say, well, this relationship is so important for me, then you will be forced internally, <laughs> I say, to uh, take some distance from your parents. Maybe not break the relationship, but you will reduce it till the minimum because it is very, uh, yeah, the feeling of guilt and the inner conflict that you will have costs too much energy. On the visible and invisible, I will come to that. I skip that to express what is a loyalty conflict. Um, I gave already an example, but that can also be way more simple, like uh, on, uh, the loyalty, for instance, you want to finish a job uh, or to be loyal to your colleagues or to your boss or to your work. And at the same time, your children ask for your attention. <laughs> so then you have also a loyalty conflict. Who do you give priority? Split lo loyalty is a specific form of a loyalty conflict. That is um, a conflict that a child has between the two parents. For instance, if one parent is distrusting the other parent, that um, and he, for instance, does not allow the child to, um, to give and receive in that relationship with the other parents, then uh, the child becomes split in loyalty. This is really very, um, yeah, that gives the child an incredible feeling of guilt. And uh, yeah, he will try, uh, for instance, in a divorce, the child will yeah, stay with or the mother or the father and uh, reduce the contact with the other parent be because of this split loyalty. So that is a brief introduction, but the most important thing, the most important element that can help you to become more self-aware yourself and help your clients is this how loyalty is expressed in visible and invisible ways. If there are questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Lily will have a look at it <laughs> and will uh, interrupt me that uh, to, uh, if there is a question that I will try to answer. How do you see visible loyalty? Yeah, when they are visible, that is the easy part. Huh? So for instance, if you choose the same profession as your father or even grandfather or mother or grandmother, that's a very, very visible, visible way of expressing your loyalty. Um, if for instance, my husband is a banker and uh, his brother works in the bank, his nephew and uh, a cousin works in the bank. So in the family, you see that people choose for the same. Uh, you have also these families where the parents are uh, teacher and then the children become teacher themselves. So that is a very visible way of being loyal. Another way of being loyal can be realize the dream of the professional dream, at least, of your father and your mother or mother, one of two. Or practicing a same hobby can be, or choosing a partner that has the same profession as your father or mother. That is very important. I just give an example of myself. Uh, I am the fourth of five siblings and my mother was teacher. And she said over and over again, the most beautiful profession for a girl is to be a teacher because then when she has children, she can be with the children during the holidays. Luckily for us, my oldest sister had really this vocation to become a teacher too. And she became a teacher. 
while doing so, the pressure for all the others became less uh, um, imposing. My two brothers did something completely different. One is a vet, the other is a pharmacist. And then my father was a banker. So my younger sister and I, I had no clue about this, this loyalty and how this worked, but I started my career in a bank and my younger sister too. We both left. And in the beginning, when I was um, a coach, when I set up my practice, it didn't work. I had very much difficulty to find clients and so on. And it was only till the moment that I realized that I was loyal to my parents by choosing a husband that works in a bank, that I gave recognition to my father, you choose the right profession. And then of the, the moment I realized that, then everything went smooth and so on. So this works very deep. And that is the invitation. Well, it is really on becoming aware of this. Uh, because otherwise you fight against windmills and you say, but I do a lot of things and still it is not working. And that can be because I have to admit my parents at the moment. So I worked in a bank. They find it very good, uh, stable job and so on. And then at the moment that I say, I will give that up and become independent and then become a coach. My parents said, but yeah, talking a bit with people, you cannot earn a living with that. So by being not successful, I was loyal to their principles. And that is really, I coach, uh, I train uh, coaches to set up their own practice. And that is one of the things that I uh, encounter over and over again, that um, people, if, if the, their parents or their siblings say, well, that's not a decent job, <laughs> look for something else, that it's really undermining them. So yeah. questions to sorry, yeah. Yeah, there is a question in the chat. Yeah. Go ahead. She Sunny is asking you about uh, how one's inaccessibility makes the other person more vulnerable. Can you expand on that? Well, if people sh don't show up, if you are in a relationship and you love the person and you want to give something to make the person happy and because this giving gives meaning to your life. But if for one reason or another, the person is um, not sharing his feeling, not sharing his expectations. So you cannot live um, the relationship in depth and that makes you vulnerable because you cannot, there is no reciprocity, no mutuality in the relationship. That is the reason of the meaning of the title of the painting. So in order for you to find how can you discover uh, visible loyalty, that is the easy part. Eh? What do you admire in what uh, your parents did? Um, and, or where do you have a similar behavior? that can be in another domain. For instance, if your parents were, um, uh, did pro bono work in the community, it can be that you do also uh, pro bono work, but somewhere different. That are also ways of being visible, uh, visibly loyal. And then we come to the most uh, important part or, uh, and the most challenging part also, that is how do invisible loyalties work? And um, that are things that you, where you have, uh, for instance, the same ideas, the same convictions, the same principles, the same judgment. And if you are not, aware of that and you act according to these principles um, even if it's damageable for you 
Uh, remember the example I gave about myself when I uh, was not successful when I set up my coaching practice in the beginning. It was, in fact, my loyalty to the principles of my parents that by talking to people you cannot do, that's not a decent job. The second one is also important, that's living the claimed values of your parents. For instance, <laughs> if you are, um, if your parents say you have to be honest and you are honest, but when they, um, um, they punish you for that. So that are, things also where they, your parents say you have to do something or that they value it, but in fact, they live it differently. And that uh, when you stay, stick to their claimed values is also um, a way of being invisibly loyal. And then another way of being invisibly loyal is by living the values in their true meaning. And what I mean by that is, for instance, if um, an example of a client, his father was, uh, they, they belong to the bourgeoisie, I don't know how you, you call that in English. Um, and his father was a, a general practitioner and he was a general practitioner too. And their parents did a lot of uh, pro bono work and uh, charity work in the community. And he became um, a practitioner, but in a, a, a hospital for poor people. And his parents were shocked by that. He said, well, we gave you such opportunities, such, um, yeah, that's not the work you are supposed to do. And for him, it was really very, um, he had, had this feeling of guilt because he said, I, I, I disappoint my parents, but, but that's my true vocation. And I belong there. I know that makes me happy to work with these people. And at the moment that he realized that this value of serving people, of charity that he put in practice, not in his free time, but in his job. And at the moment that he, would, he understood that, a lot of pressure uh, was dropped. And then last, having a similar way of compensation, that is in behavior, um, yeah, the, the same uh, traits that you can have, be chaotic or whatever, uh, that you can also be loyal, even if you don't realize it or if you don't like it. The, book that I said, that is the dreams of my father is a, a book from Barack Obama that he wrote long before he was famous and long before he was president. And in fact, that is a fantastic example of how this invisible loyalty work and how it can used can be very positive. Barack Obama, his mother divorced, oh, fine, no, the father left his mother when Barack was, I think, one year or so, or not even, six months. And uh, so he was brought up by his mother alone. Uh, as you all know, the mother was white. And um, when, but the mother always taught, uh, talked very respectfully of the father. And when Barack was 10, his father came one month to visit um, his mother and grandparents because he lived also with the, the maternal grandparents. And he gave Barack a basketball when he uh, came and he knew. And the second thing he did that was he held a speech for the uh, classmates of, uh, in the, at the school where Barack was. And he was very impressed. First, he didn't want his father <laughs> to show up there, but all the children were uh, listening very attentively to the father. And 
there he realized this gift of being able to touch people with words. So what did Barak do? He played basketball as much as he could. And that was one way, especially as a black boy, to get, accessed, uh, get accepted because that's only uh, one of the few sports where blacks are better than whites. So, um, and the second thing, yeah, he developed this capacity to speak. You all have heard uh, his speeches. So in fact, that are two small things because that was the only, that month was the only month that he had contact with his father. And then when he was in his twenties, he wanted to visit his father. And while he was doing, uh, trying to figure out how to get to Kenya, he received the message from his half sister that the father passed away. So apart from this month, this, he didn't see him. However, this um, shows how people can, um, yeah, how even if you have very little things that you can be creative with that and really be invisible loyal in a positive way. Questions to uh, consider is what values do you share with your parents? What is irritating you in the behavior of your, your parents and that you do maybe in another, uh, in another domain or in other situations? Um, so, yeah, also what do you do consciously or unconsciously, mostly unconsciously, to boycott yourself when you make a choice that is against the will of your parents. Uh, remember the example that I give. But that's very often also uh, when you want to make a career or so, that also has an impact sometimes that if you have to travel for that and your parents don't allow that, then you will become ill just before you have to leave for the, the, this project or so. So I will stop talking. I want you, Lily, if you can do that, put you in breakout rooms for three, uh, for nine minutes, uh, breakout rooms of three person. And I want you to discuss with what you have heard so far, in which ways you are loyal to your father, in which ways you are loyal to your mother, and how does that influence professional choices you made? So you have in total, nine minutes to discuss with each other. And just before we go off, Thea, um, there yeah. is a question. What are people yeah. loyal to then? Declared values or real values? Please. So well, maybe that can, if you have, yeah, I see what well, I see the question. Um, you can be loyal to the declared values, um, but uh, if you, the one of, Honesty, the, the example that I gave, uh, but if you are loyal to the real value, for instance, uh, be true to a person, be, um, then if your parents say you have to be uh, true, but they don't behave like that, uh, that are the, the declared values, and if you are loyal to the real value, so be you are true, that can create a conflict. Because your parents, if you do that, if you live the real value, uh, they are confronted, even if it's unconscious, because you do something different than they did. I hope this is an answer to your question. So can you, Put them in breakout rooms. Okay, maybe? here we go. Nine minutes. And T, I put you in a room, but you don't accept it. No. Okay. It was just one way of making it uh, work. Here, two or three reactions from what you want to share what you want to find out about you being loyal to or your father or your mother 
Yes, Sunni, go ahead. Yes, I, we were talking and I realized that in my family, I don't know where there is loyalty, but I wanted to ask you if you can skip a generation. My parents were both in the medical field. Neither my sister or I really, I, we both thought we wanted to go that, but my nephew now is a physician. And yeah. I wanted to find out about that. Yes, that was why I put in the poll, the poll at the beginning, grandfather, grandmother. So sometimes you, it can skip a generation. I have uh, seen uh, my, my brother, um, his parents-in-law were farmers, or, or okay, were farmers, they are retired now, and he's a veterinarian, so it's already in the direction, but his son studied law and uh, history, and at the age of 30, he became a farmer. So uh, that's, and that's out of loyalty because it was, he tells us that uh, the, the, the example of his grandfather inspired him, that he said, well, all the business, the emails, that's so, you don't see it. And uh, when you work on the land, you see <laughs> outcome of what you do. So uh, yeah, that can, that's possible. Other reactions or questions? Yes. Please go ahead. I'm the, the, the fourth of four children and, and I'm way out in my profession of for what my family did. There's no one ever have been a psychologist or whatever we call a soul uh, squeezer. Uh, this, so where does it come from for me? I assume, I don't know you that well, but it can be that uh, because you are the fourth of four children, so that one of your older siblings choose the same profession as your father or mother. So for loyalty, that is already covered. And if that is covered, younger children have more freedom to do something else. Okay. However, well, there it is important that you realize that and also see how you can be loyal in an other domain. You still need to be the son of your parents. So maybe you choose a partner with the same profession as one of your parents, or you choose you you choose a hobby that um, yeah, where you can make the difference. Uh, where you can prove that you are loyal to your family of origin. Okay, well, I have to dig di deeper then <laughs> to, to find out. I have to dig deeper to find out. Well, I come, can give you an example. Reminder. Just to, for illustration of one of my clients, um, I was talking uh, you, while you were in the breakout rooms. Um, I had a client and he was brought up in a family. Uh, of blue colors, but he was very intelligent. And the, uh, the teacher at school came to his parents and said, please let him study, let him study. And uh, he could at last, uh, with a lot of uh, try, uh, uh, it, it cost a lot of effort to convince the parents to allow their son to uh, study. So he did. And um, he, became first assistant professor at the university, and then he had a job as an engineer. And um, yeah, he did that for a while. And he came to me because he wanted to make a career move and to become the head of, um, oh, where they, they worked, uh, yeah, let's say a big manufacturing for people with a limitation. And he said, but Theo, I cannot do that because that's a step down in the perception of people and so on. And I know that, knew that he had a very um, distant relationship with his father and he suffered a lot from that. And in the coaching, I made, I, we questioned and explored that together. And I said, to what extent 
the distance that you feel with your father has to do with the fact that he has no clue what your life is. And maybe he thinks that you look down on him because he did not study. And um, a second thing was to make the, the shift to that other job. I said, but this can be, uh, I explained in all the things about loyalty. And I said, by choosing this job, you can use your intelligence and the experience that you have, and you do it in a manufacturing. Um, so that is a way to be invisible loyal to your father. And what was very strange, if I, I said, can you try to have a conversation uh, with your father about that? And as you all know, uh, women, mothers and daughters, they talk, and fathers and son, they do things together. So the father, uh, they had the common hobby of sailing. And he asked his father, can we make a sailing trip? Yeah. And then he, uh, we, we prepared that and he brought his discussion up and his father effectively said, but I think you look down on me because I didn't study, I don't know this world. And he said then, I'm proud of what you do, but it's a strange uh, uh, world, I don't know. And for him, it was so meaningful that at last he got this recognition from his father, and then he made the switch, and he's thriving in his job, huh? even if he works very... The Belgian authorities don't make his life easy, but... Um, and seeing that he's uh, loyal in this way really helps him. Um, another example that I can give is, um, because that can also be in live events. Huh? I had a client that um, he was, his father was a, a physician and he studied, uh, no, his father was a physician and he uh, passed away when my client was 14 years. It was not allowed. The mother was really uh, suffering. So the children could not express any grief. And uh, he studied, he became also a physician specialized in I don't know what. Um, and uh, I knew him. Uh, a while he came in coaching and then he stopped and he called me and he said Thea I don't know what happens in my life but I'm um, I feel a bit depressed I'm bad tempered I'm irritated for I don't know for the slightest reason um, and I said is there something happening in your life is it bad in your relationship or whatever no, my children are happy. The relationship with my, my wife is good. Uh, I, I have no problems at work. I really don't understand what is happening. And I remember he had three children. And I asked him, how old is your oldest child? And he said, 14. So unconsciously, he, he saw his, his son and he said, wow. He realized, but unconsciously, well, that the, his son was still a child. And the fact that the, the son was 14 raised in him all the grief that he had that could never be expressed. And he said, well, that's probably <laughs> right what you say. And now, how, how do I deal with that? And we look together what is a, was uh, something that you have in common with your father. And apparently the father was playing piano and um, he was playing at a very good level and uh, they invited them friends. They gave little house concerts. And then they said, I have really very good memories because then my mother and my father collaborated together. And that was, I have really good memories of that. However, <laughs> He played piano himself, uh, but due to the fact that he didn't feel well, he didn't play anymore. So long story short, I invited him to say, well, 
could you discuss with your wife and children whether in honor of your father, because he was 45 at the age uh, that he came to me. Um, and when you do that very consciously, you organize this concert in to commemorate your father uh, and tell this story to your children so that they know that too. And he did, his wife was immediately very enthusiastic to do this. And um, yeah, for him that really helped to grieve for his father, but also express his invisible loyalty and, and he find peace with that. So, I don't know <laughs> how I came, I, I came to the uh, examples of, of this. So as an inspiration, um, I will share my screen again. So that are things um, to take in account. Oh. I'll give you the time to read it. Um, so that are things to take in account. So, uh, so what happened in uh, two questions to take in account is, um, oh, I was too early. Uh, what happened in the life of the parent of the same sex that we look first, uh, when he or she was the age you have now? Very often, uh, for instance, if uh, the example that I gave, you know, that's the example of the second um, question, what happened in your life when you were the same sex, uh, the same age as your oldest child? Uh, for the first, that can be, for instance, another client who um, at the age of 51, everything broke down in her life. She divorced, she had a major financial loss. And um, the third thing I forgot, she, she lost her job too. And then there also we explored uh, what happened in the life of um, one of your parents. Her parents were divorced when she was very young and she realized her father died in an car accident at the age of 51. So that are also, uh, and especially she, the contact with her father was very uh, limited, so to speak. Um, and so that can also be uh, a, a link with loyalty. Especially you have to ask these questions if you don't, um, of course, if there is nothing obvious or nothing significant or nothing different in the life now, then very often it has to do with uh, the previous generation or things that happened in the past. So bring that to supervision um, because that <laughs> uh, has of course an impact all these uh, forms of loyalty, you bring it to your practice, both as a client and as a coach. Uh, because the form of loyalty you live uh, towards your parents has an impact, especially the values that you live um, and that you take on from your parents. Uh, a good question to ask, what are the, uh, the values that I receive from my parents and that I want to pass down to my children, but that are also values that you will try to live uh, in your coaching, in your practice. And the clients that you have who will have similar values, otherwise they go to somebody else. Uh, so you feel attracted and they to, to you when you have similar values. However, it's important to become conscious of this. And because also the, yeah, we cannot go deeper in it, but the way that your place in the child role has also an impact on how you, um, how you act. Uh, all the children, for instance, receive always uh, the message 
you are the oldest child, you have to give the good example. So also in your coaching, you will give the good example or try at least to do that unconsciously. Um, so, and what is the impact on your coaching relationship? Um, also, when you observe your clients, uh, when you want to help them to become more aware, also you ask these questions, what, what kind of loyalty does the client live? Uh, to what extent he's loyal to his father, to his uh, mother? Uh, for instance, sometimes, Clients who are brought up um, and their parents say you have, for instance, if a father lost his job, uh, when parents will say, take a, uh, make sure that you have a, a job at the government because that is uh, safe, safe uh, or secure, people won't dare often to, to become independent or do something uh, start their own company or choose to uh, change to a less secure between brackets sector. So that are things to explore also with your clients. I want you to give the time for a second breakout room. You will be put all again with groups of three, but with other uh, persons. And the question is, which forms of loyalty, more visible, invisible, uh, do you live as a coach? And how does it influence your way of coaching? And what is the impact on the relationship with you and your coaches or supervisees? Okay, you have again nine minutes like the previous time. And I hope you enjoy, enjoy the exchange. Welcome back. Um, I would like if some of you want to share about your exchange, something. Lynn, can I say what you what you said? Is that right? So Lynn, Lynn said this really interesting thing, which was about um, the, the language used in the in America around um, the military, like recruitment chief chief exec officer, all these, all these titles, you know, and just how they've been in, how, how that, so there's a loyalty to all of that, you know, and uh, that's, that's really powerful, really, really powerful, you know, you know I, the way that I heard it in the group. And we were talking about how some of the values that were passed on by our parents or grandparents um, for example, the military model of leading people, how that's changed uh, in today's workplace. And yet, you know, that doesn't necessarily go away. And uh, so, it, and it doesn't really work so well in many cases today. Yeah. And then it's finding ways huh, to be true to the values and adapt to the system, that's not easy. Other? I just want to recognize the value of this session, which helped me very interesting uh, way to, to look things that usually we don't look. And in the second part, it was interesting to see not my loyalty from upside, but from down with my son, <laughs> I discovered, of course, the big influence that I've been working 30 years in, in, in advertising and I love movies from I was a kid and he comes with me to the movie and I introduced to that. And what is finished happening that he created an advertising uh, company for movies promotion and he's a director of movies and series. And, and I say, well, no, that is, I don't know if that was my frustrated part or that was my influence or whatever, but it, I looked at in, in that and I see when, how this influenced him and how this can influence in my coaching and supervision. A lot more we spoke, but I want to share that, that it was interesting to see down. Well, not only yeah, that. thank you for sharing that. And it's a fantastic example because if that is then 
in alignment with the talents of your son, then they are very creative in finding a way to be loyal to you and loyal to themselves by developing their talents. And then very often they are happy in their job and they are uh, they thrive. Huh? Yeah. I saw somebody put in the chat, uh, Daniela, it was you, the I miss I you. Um, and that's true. Well, sometimes negative things can uh, pass down from generation to generation. Like, for instance, um, um, generation unemployment. That is uh, a negative form of loyalty towards the or uh, family of origin. Also, generation poverty, for instance, can also be um, a way of finding, uh, of expressing loyalty, invisible loyalty then, of course. Um, it's sometimes hard to do, especially if you are the first in the family to do something different, huh? like study or, or break a pattern, or for him, but that can also be, I told, I'm brought up in a very Catholic family, and uh, I was the first from the five, my brothers and sisters, they are, married, have children, and I didn't marry. And when I met my husband, now we are married, but we live together. For my mother, that was um, very, very tough to accept. That. And for me also, I felt guilt, unless I realized that I was loyal to the true value of being faithful to the other. That changed my then I could let go of the guilt towards my parents. So that are also things where you can uh, leave that loyalty. Okay, we have a couple of more minutes. Anybody else yeah. has anything they'd like to share? I would like to, to just to add something. Sometimes we are loyal to the, uh, um, if some um, parents, that we have, I mean, parents or grandparents uh, didn't have the chance to do what they dream to do. Yeah. Uh, um, sometimes you have uh, children or grandchildren that are related to that and they feel to be or to do this kind of job that it's not their own intention, but the intention comes from the connection with the grandpa or grand grandpa for example and yeah. so we always had to be careful with the children and the grandchildren to understand what they try to help or to transform the the dream in reality of their uh, grandpa or yeah. grand grandpa and that can be an expressed dream or unexpressed expectations huh? absolutely be... it could be explicit or implicit could be known or non known. Yeah. And uh, sure. this that's why the the parents, the, the the role of the parents is to explain from which family they come and what were was the, the dream of their father and mother and grandfather and grandma to yeah. just be sure that the children that they have and grandchildren are not going to be in a wrong way and yeah. not in their own yeah. life. This is the, the trick. <laughs> that is a beautiful thought to close down the session, but I give the last words to Lily, um, maybe for announcements that we have to make for the next time. Well, thank you, Thea. This is really great in that we, we're looking at it through a different lens, as some people have said, and it really gets me thinking about how I chose my profession as well and how my children chose their professions. So it's, it's interesting and provocative. Uh, just to let people know, our next session is on November 22nd. We're talking about complexity. And uh, the conference is now open for early registrations. And I know a number of you here are presenting at the conference. We we'll look forward to that very much. So without further ado, thank you very much for coming and engaging in the conversation. And uh, we'll see you at the next session. Thank you.
Yeah, big hand. Take care. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Tia. It was 